Welcome to Rosebud Homestead. For the past several months, we have done um, 10 videos on using WEC jars in canning. Um, so I have enough experience now that I feel like it is about time for us to do a video on comparison between ball jars and WEC jars in terms of several different criteria. So we'll get started in just a moment. have a selection of uh, some of the things that I have canned using wet jars. Here's some apple pie filling and some green chili chicken. Here is some salmon and um, some jams and cherries. This is one of our, in fact right now, this video is our most popular video. The second most popular video is over on this side with the ball canning. And this second, can the second most popular is beef stew. Now, some of you may be a little bit shocked that the rings are still on these jars. As I have mentioned before, we store our jars with the rings on, and that is not what the USDA recommends. Now, however, you need to know that all of these rings are just very loose. They are not tied down tightly. And so the reason that, we, um, that you take the rings off is so that if the gas is produced by microorganisms on the inside of the jar, it will pop the lid loose. If this ring is clamped down tight, it will still hold this in place and the food might not be really good. So we just put them there on loosely and uh, it's simply because I like to store them there rather than having several drawers full of these bands. So here are the two different jars, types of jars. And I've done pretty much the same type of things. Here's vegetables, here's applesauce, here's beef chunks, here's beans. And so um, the food is pretty well evenly distributed. So the first thing I want to compare them on is aesthetics. So that is eye appeal. So as we look at these jars um, and compare the eye appeal, eye appeal of course is in the eye of the beholder. And I'll tell you, when I, when I look at it, a jar of canned peaches or a jar of canned applesauce, you know, they both have a certain amount of appeal to me. Uh, it makes me feel really good that I've spent some time and we have this food all preserved and put away for use at a later time. But I do have to admit that I love the shape of the WEC jars. So, um, and the different styles. They come in um, several different sizes and several different styles. So for me, the aesthetics of the WEC jars um, is my preference. But that's not the only thing we need to think about when we um, compare these two. The next thing, and probably one of the most important ones, is the documentation. So what documentation exists that helps us do a good job of canning? Well, for the ball jars, we have decades and decades of USDA scientific testing uh, behind how to can with the ball jar system. I have read some of the original scientific reports from decades ago and I have been pretty impressed with the documentation. The USDA is one of the sources that I trust implicitly. A close second to that is the ball blue book because all of the recipes and all of the instructions in the Ball Blue Books um, exactly follow what the USD recommendations are, and they do their own testing as well. So th those are two sure sources that we can go to for recipes and for instructions that we know that we can trust. Now, in terms of the wet jars, that is not the case. One of these days, hopefully, the USDA will do some testing on the wet jars. I've heard rumors that they might do that, but I know nothing for sure. 
And so right now, we cannot rely on the surety of the USDA testing. So what is out there for us to rely on? Well, in a couple of words, not much, because it is so contradictory. Some of the documentation that uh, came with the jars that I purchased um, the, there's either a sheet of paper or a little booklet sometimes, and sometimes in the, in the boxes with the jars, there's nothing. And so in reading that information and in doing a ton of research, I'm a researcher by profession, so I, I, go, I know how to go after information. And that information about wet jars is so contradictory. Some of the things that come out of Europe are very different than the instructions that come out of um, the United States. And so who do we trust? What, how, how do we rectify that in our own minds so that we know that we are uh, doing things the right way? Well, from my perspective, when the information clashes with each other and when there are claims over here and claims over there, uh, some of the folks that have uh, commented on our wet canning have said, no, no, you're doing it wrong, you need to do it this way. And no, you, you do it this way. And even the comments contradict. Some people claim to work for a distributor in Europe. Others say, no, that's not right. So uh, the babble, I don't even listen to. What I do is I depend on my own experience and my own scientific knowledge to know for myself the best way. And I have tested that over the last few months and I have come to the conclusion, and I'll go through um, what I do with these so that I can share that with you uh, when we get to uh, down the list a little bit of the things that we're going to be talking about. So in terms of documentation, uh, the comparison, there's just no comparison. There's a whole, whole lot more reliable information with the uh, ball system than there is with the WEC system. And my advice to you, if you're going to use the WEC system is, you can do your own research and you can rely on your own knowledge or you can find someone's opinion that you can trust, but no. Okay, so I need to back up here for a second. I don't, when I teach my university students in science about trusting a claim, when someone makes a claim, unless they provide documented evidence for that claim and by documented evidence, in the case of canning, I mean laboratory evidence. Um, evidence where some good solid testing, scientifically sound testing has been done. And people who make claims without documentation, I don't pay any attention to. I trust my own instincts better than that. So just be careful who you trust on things. And, um, and I'm not telling you that you need to trust me. I am just telling you that this is how I do it. I'm a PhD science educator, and I have a lot of years of experience with canning, but I'm not right 100% of the time, so every person needs to make choices for themselves. Canning is all about science. Um, there's so much in life that is just all about science that we just take for granted. But in canning, the solid foundation of canning is science. It's physics, it's microbiology, and it is material science. In terms of physics, you know these things. It's temperature, it's pressure, it's how to form a vacuum. And we know these things instinctively and by our previous experience. And so depending on the scientific knowledge that we already have, we can put together a pretty good pathway to use wet jars. So let's go on to the next one, which is efficacy. Now, I really love efficacy. That's actually what I did my PhD dissertation on with science teaching efficacy. And that's whether or not you achieve the desired results. So in canning, what's our desired results? Well, of course, it is food safety. It is the preservation of food so that we, are, we feel confident that our family can eat it without getting some kind of uh, food poisoning of any kind. And so in comparing these two systems, if everything is done correctly, and that's a user issue, that resides right here. So if, if the user knows what they're doing and everything is done appropriately, the outcome of food safety is the same for both. I have these 
jars on our shelf to just show that these are the data showing that both systems can give us the desired results. So efficacy for both of these is quite high. So let's talk for just a minute about the efficiency. And that is a totally different thing than efficacy. Efficiency is all about the workflow and what happens during processing and whether things are streamlined. I'm all about efficiency. My mother was an efficiency expert. I'll tell you, with a household of nine children, she had to be efficient in everything that she did. And so I learned at a very young age how to work as efficiently as possible, and I have kept that up all throughout my life. So let's go through things. For the ball canning system, you have a jar. For the wet canning system, you have a jar. All right, so putting the food in both, probably a draw. Both of them are about the same. And this is, of course, assuming that the jars have been cleaned properly, that all of your equipment is cleaned and sanitized when necessary. So here we go. So the food is in our jar. Probably that's a wash. So the next thing that happens is we take um, a knife and we get the air out of the jars. Probably that one is a draw as well. Then we take a little towel and we wipe the rims. That, that's probably the same too. So next we put on the lids. Now here is where we start diverging. For the ball process, here's the lid. We pop that lid on and then we put the ring on and boom, we're done. Ready for the canner. For the WEC jar, it's a couple of more steps. It doesn't take all that much longer. But what we do here is we put the gasket in place right here, invert it over the jar, and then we fasten it down with a couple of clips. So probably, I'm guessing, several seconds difference in the efficiency in terms of getting the jars ready for the canner. So the workflow is um, a little bit more efficient with the ball system. Now in terms of processing, this is something very different. For the ball system, in the canners that are made in our country in the United States, we can fit seven of these quart jars into a canner. For the ball system, this is the jar that is closest to a quart. It is actually a liter, so it's a, a few ounces, two or three ounces, can't remember for sure off the top of my head, um, more than a quart. But because it's, these are wider and bulged at the bottom, we can only fit five of these in a canner. So, um, in terms of efficiency of how many we can do in a batch, the ball jar is much more efficiency, uh, it, much more efficient in, in that regard. Now, what about processing? So, we process either by water bath or by pressure canning. And the times are established in this country by the USDA and we have all kinds of, in many places all over the internet and in cookbooks, we have the processing time for quarts and pints and half pints, but there's no processing time given for the WEC jars. So I have done a little bit of math to try to calculate um, which how much more time we have to add if there are a couple of ounces more in these jars. And really, it's not that much. So pretty much if we add about five minutes, we're right in the ballpark and everything will be fine. Okay, so let's go on to the last uh, criteria, and that is cost. And cost is pretty important, um, especially these days when even though the economy is pretty good, um, many of us are still on pretty tight budgets, and so we have to watch the spending of every dollar. So in this country, these ball jars are, oh, anywhere between, you can get them for just sometimes under a dollar up to about a dollar fifty each. Cases of 12 range from $9.99 up to uh, $14, $15.99, and there are 12 per um, box. WEC jars, on the other hand, are about $3 to $5 a piece, and they come in boxes of six. 
Now, I have purchased a total of 15 boxes of jars. That gives me 90 wet jars. So I have, at this point in time, probably about 75 jars filled with food that I have processed. And so um, the cost of processing is going to be more for wet jars because I can't fit as many jars per batch. So just in energy costs alone, it, is, it costs a little bit more to process wet jars than it does ball jars. So not only the cost per jar, but the processing um, time, the, the processing costs are more for wet jars. So let's talk about the cost of failure rate. And this is really, really important. Now I have been canning with ball jars for mm, more than 50 years. Uh, probably close to 55 years I have been using the ball system. And in that time, um, even if all we count is the time from when I left home to get married, since I was married, um, I cannot even remember that I have um, had very many jars. I can't even remember one failure in a ball jar. I'm sure there must have been, but they don't stand out in my mind because it has not happened very often. So the failure rate, uh, and by failure rate, I mean when a vacuum fails to form. So after processing, that sound means this jar is not sealed. But that sound and this sound, these have all sealed. So these have all good vacuum seals, but this one does not. So I rarely, I can't even remember having a failure that when I pulled a ball jar out of the canner and it did not seal. So in jars, I don't have that kind of a record. Because um, of these gaskets, um, I, have a, I have a better track record for water bath canning than I do for pressure canning. Um, and for pressure canning, one of the things that happens, and I saw this on this one after I pulled it off the shelf, if you look really closely, you can see right here how that, did I get it in the right place? Yeah, this right here, see how the gasket has been pushed out. And so what happens is, when the food inside heats up and begins to boil, and the same thing happens with ball jars, but the air has to escape and be replaced by steam. So there's going to be steam exiting the jars during the canning process. In the ball system, it does not disrupt any of the parts. It just happens, it just does it. And it, it is able to get out without pushing anything around. Here, as it goes out, it can sometimes push the gasket. And I would say maybe three times maybe four times in some of the pressure canning um, batches that I have done. I've had a gasket that has pulled so far out that it's no longer sealed and the vacuum can't form. And so when that happens, that's a failure rate. So that has to do with efficiency, it has to do with cost. And so I end up putting the jar of food in the refrigerator. It does never go to waste. We certainly always eat it. It's just an annoyance and it is a little bit of a, um, an inconvenience when that happens. And besides, if I'm doing these larger size jars, it means that I only have four good ones to put out on the shelf instead of five. So that is an issue as well. Now I want to go over a couple of things that the various um, sources of literature say about the WEC system and how I have adjusted. So pretty much I use the USDA time chart. Sometimes I will add a little bit more time, especially with pressure canning. So here is the bottom line on um, a few things. First of all, there is conflicting information on whether or not to reuse these gaskets. And I have four of these gaskets set out right here. Jim is going to get a real close-up and um, let you take a good hard look at those. Now I'm going to show you this ball lid. Sometimes these ball lids are called flats. And so here's this, here is the sealing compound on this lid. Sealing compound is sprayed on very thin 
This is a very thin coat. You can almost scratch it off with your fingernail. This is good for one use, uh, for canning. You can reuse them if you're just putting leftovers in a jar and putting them in your refrigerator, but in terms of forming a vacuum seal, these can be safely used only one time. So we know that about ball jars and they, we know that that is an expense. Now these gaskets are far different from the inside of those ball lids. These gaskets are much thicker. And this is where materials science comes in that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are rubber. And if we know the material, then we can pretty much make some decisions on our own. Some of the literature, the research that I have read say, says, use these only one time and then throw them away. And I said, what? Are you kidding me? These are not as cheap as the lids on the ball jar by any stretch of the imagination. They're nice, thick rubber compound. Um, and so I'm thinking, surely we can reuse these. And other sources say, of course you can reuse them. Six, seven, eight times you can reuse them. So I thought, okay, so this is one time where I've got to revert back to my experience and my scientific knowledge. So if we look at these really closely, can you see which ones have been used before? Can you tell? I'm going to turn them over and see if there's a difference on the other side. And this one is the side up. Can you see a little groove right here? And on this one? Now I'm going to put a brand new one beside these so that you can compare. So here's the brand new one. Now this is what my brain tells me. These are made of rubber. They're thick. We can wash these. And um, the, some instructions say to boil them, some say don't boil them. I have been boiling them for two minutes. I trust that instruction because I think that these need to be sanitized just a little bit. Who knows what might be lurking there. But the thing about rubber is that it stretches. And so you can stretch it and examine it. And I, this is what I do. After I have used these, I before I use them again, I pull them apart all the way around and I look for nicks in the edges, I look for cracks in the rubber, and I look for places that have been stretched completely out of shape. Now, several weeks ago, when I was doing the, um, the green chili chicken right here, and I, we opened uh, one, and when I pulled the gasket out, it was very stretched out of shape and misshapen. I wish that I would have kept that one, just to show you. I knew immediately that that one could not be reused. But now take a look at these. This is the new one right here. Some of these, a couple of these have been used for um, pressure canning and a couple have been used for water bath. More than one time, more than two times. Some of these, uh, this one right here, I have used three times. And I would use this one again because I've examined it. And then I just boil it. Boiling it also helps the material to come back to its original shape just a little bit. And so I have no qualms at all about reusing these gaskets so long as I do a good inspection. What's the worst thing that can happen? You won't get a seal and therefore you'll have to put the uh, food in the refrigerator. It's not like it's gonna poison the food. And so am I willing to take a little bit of chance on this? Yep, I am. Now, the other thing is, is it two clips or is it three clips? So for those of you that have watched our videos, when I do water bath canning, I will do two clips and pop them on almost opposite each other. However, when I do pressure canning, I use three clips. That was the instruction in one of the um, places that I researched. Three for pressure canning, two for water bath. So that's how I started doing it. And I like three clips for pressure canning. When you think about the science of what happens inside a pressure canner, 
when that pressure goes up to 10 or 15 pounds per square inch, when the temperature on the inside goes up to 250 degrees, when the insides are boiling a whole lot, it seems to me logically that three points of closure would be better than two. And so I've made that choice myself. Um, I see, have seen online where other people just use two for pressure canning and for them it seems to work okay. So maybe it doesn't even really matter as long as we have two or three clips. So in the end, here is what I think. I think I'm about done purchasing WEC jars. I think I have enough of an investment. 90 jars is a, a nice percentage of my total overall all jars. I love them. I'm willing to um, trade out oh, some of the efficiency and some of the cost because I love the aesthetics of how these look. I don't think I'm gonna be purchasing very many more. The only one I might do this spring if our asparagus um, plot produces as much as it has been, I might buy the tall skinny wet jar um, and can some asparagus, but that we'll see that in the spring. One adjustment that I have made, because I have had three jars, or maybe even four, but I think it's only three jars, wet jars fail in pressure canning, I am no longer going to use wet jars for pressure canning. I'm only going to use wet jars for water bath canning. My go-to jars will still be the ball jars. Those are the most efficient from my perspective. They're the most cost effective. Their efficacy is great. Um, and the aesthetics, I've always gotten a big kick out of seeing my jars of canned food lining a shelf. So the aesthetics, they're okay for me too. So I hope that this has been useful to you, that the information will help um, give you a direction on the research that you may also want to follow up on. Um, I'm not at all going to stop using WEC jars. I have that investment. I'm going to keep doing them and they're great for water bath canning. So hope this was useful and we will get back to our regular type of videos with our next one. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.